Uh, welcome to today's class. The class is on exode deviations and we'll focus more on intermittent exotropia. Uh, the moderator for today's class is Dr. Akila Ramkumar, ma'am. There are a few theories of exode deviations which have been put forth. The first one being Wirth's theory, which is the theory of role of defective vision uh, fusion. So it states that when the fusion faculty is inadequate, the eyes are in a state of unstable equilibrium and hence they are ready to squint either inwards or outwards on slight provocation. Another theory which was put forth by Kushner, which highlights the role of AC by A ratio states that the AC by A ratio is either normal or just slightly higher than normal in patients who have intermittent exotropia. Correspondingly, in a study which Kushner carried out, he found that approximately 60% of the patients with two divergence excess had a higher AC by A ratio. However, around 40% of the people still had a normal AC by A ratio. The third theory which we have is the theory of hemiretinal suppression put forth by Knapp and Jampolsky in which they say that there occurs a progression from exophoria to bilateral bitemporal hemiretinal bilateral bitemporal hemiretinal suppression and then to intermittent exotropia and the ability of the eye to suppress temporal vision allows the eye to diverge the fourth theory which has been put forth is the role of refractive error in an uncorrected myo the uncorrected myo uses less than normal accommodative effort during near vision and hence they have decreased accommodative convergence which leads to exotropia in a patient with a high degree of uncorrected hypermetropia no effort is made to overcome the refractive error by an accommodative effort and clear vision is not attained and hence this understimulated accommodation leads to an underactive accommodative conversions and the ac by a ratio remains low which leads to an exotropia so there are four basic theories of exodeviation, which is the role of defective fusion, role of AC by A ratio, role of hemiretinal suppression, and the role of refractive error. Broadly, exodeviations can be classified into pseudo-exotropia, exophoria, intermittent exotropia, exotropia. Exotropia can be classified into concomitant and incom inconcomitant. In concomitant exotropia, the deviation will be same in all the gazes. In inconcomitant exotropia, the angle of deviation will vary according to gaze. Concomitant exotropia can be further divided into congenital, primary, sensory, and consecutive exotropia. Coming to the topic at hand for today, which is intermittent exotropia. In intermittent exotropia, the deviation becomes manifest intermittently, hence the name. This manifests intermittently when the fusional conversion fails to control the deviation which is noticed by parents when the child is ill, daydreaming, or tired, or is not attentive. This intermittent exotropia is the most common form of manifest exodeviation and is seen in at least 70 to 90 percent of exotropias. The onset of intermittent exotropia is before five years of age, and females are more predisposed to develop intermittent exotropia than males. Coming to the classifications put forth for intermittent exotropia, we have two classifications, one given by Burian and one given by Kushner. Study them simultaneously. In the divergence excess type of Burian's classification, in the divergence excess type of Burian's classification, the distance deviation is more than the near deviation, and the difference between them is at least 10 prism diopters. In Kushner's classification, this divergence excess has been divided into two subtypes, which include proximal convergence and high AC by uh, Benham, I think you just stick to one classification and then you go on to the next one because otherwise it might be too confusing for them to understand. Actually, as postgraduates, if you know even the Burian's classification, I think that should be good enough. But as a fellow, I think you should know the Kushner's classification because when you're planning management, then Kushner's is actually very important for you to differentiate the high and low AC by A ratio and plan your surgery accordingly. So for theory, uh, this thing for postgraduate, I think if you can understand Burian's classification, it should be good enough. So you just explain sure. Burian's first and then you switch over to Kushner's. Okay, ma'am. Okay. So in divergence excess pattern, we have a distance deviation, which is more than the near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters, even after performing the patch test. Then the second type is simulated divergence excess. In simulated divergence excess, the distance deviation is more than the near, near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters. However, on monocular occlusion or patching the eye, which breaks the proximal fusion, the deviation, the distance deviation and near deviation come within 10 prism diopters of each other. Hence, it is known as a simulated divergence axis. 
the second type of simulated divergence excess in variance classification includes one which we can dissociate with using plus three darter lenses which actually relaxes the accommodation and hence relaxes the accommodative conversions here initially before the plus three darter lenses are put we have distance deviation which is more than near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters on using plus three diopter lenses the distance deviation and near deviation come within 10 prism diopters of each other with distance being more than near in all cases the fourth type variance classification is the basic type in which distance is distance deviation is more than near deviation by less than 10 prism diopters and the fifth type is conversion sense sufficiency wherein the near deviation is more than distance deviation by at least 10 prism diopters. So coming to Kushner's classification, we have two entities in the divergence excess uh, part, which is proximal convergence and high AC by A ratio. In proximal convergence, the AC by A ratio will be normal, whereas in high AC by A ratio, the patients will have high AC by A ratio. The distance deviation will be more than near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters. Similar to the simulated divergence excess, here, the tenacious proximal fusion in which the distance deviation is more than near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters and on breaking the proximal fusion by patching the eye for at least half an hour to 45 minutes, the distance and near deviation come within 10 prism diopters of each other. In this high AC by A ratio patient, we have distance which is distance deviation which is more than near deviation by at least 10 prism diopters and on relaxing the accommodation we find that the distance and near deviation come within 10 prism diopters of each other and the patient has a high AC by A ratio. The basic type is same in Kushner's classification and Burian's classification wherein the distance and near deviation are within 10 prism diopters of each other with distance deviation being more. In convergence insufficiency, Kushner has divided it into three types which is one with having a low AC by A ratio which means that the a patient has an accommodative convergence insufficiency. The patient with a normal AC by A ratio is going to have insufficiency of the fusional convergence and a pseudo in convergence insufficiency in which the near deviation was initially more than the distance deviation by at least 10 prism diopters. However, on monocular occlusion, the near deviation and distance deviation come within 10 prism diopters of each other. So the Kushner's classification is a bit detailed than the Burian's classification and as ma'am rightly said, the Kushner's classification will help guide our management. Coming to the etiology of exo intermittent exotropia, there were two theories which were put forward, one by Duane and the other by Bilchowski. Duane put forth that the exodeviations are caused by an innovational imbalance that upsets the reciprocal relationship between active conversions and diversions mechanism, which is that it is an inversional mechanism. However, Pilchowski later stated that only innervational imbalance does not explain the phenomenon and he put forth a few anatomical and mechanical factors which are essential in developing intermittent exotropia and exo exodeviations in general, which include the orientation, shape and size of the orbits, size and shape of the globes, volume and viscosity of the retrobulbar tissue, the functioning of eye muscles as determined by their insertion, length of the muscles, elasticity, anatomical and structural arrangement, and the condition, condition of the fascia, fascia and ligaments of the orbit. So combining these two theories, we have the modern theories, which are a combination of both the innervational and mechanical theories. Patient of intermittent exotropia is going to initially have an exophoria, then he is going to develop intermittent exotropia, and then he is going to have periods of phoria and tropia. In the phase of exophoria, the patient is going to have binocular fixation and normal retinal correspondence. In the phase of intermittent exotropia, young children have a peculiar phenomenon which is photalgy or diplopia phobia in which when they look at a bright light, the bright light acts as a dissociating factor which causes their eyes to diverge. The young children are also prone to development of hemiretinal suppression and development of scotomas. Young children usually will not what develop exactly? the presentation like you said photalgia what do you yeah, mean ma'am ma uh, they'll be like, they'll be not uh, wanting to go in bright light ma'am yeah typically if you see children i mean parents of children who come and present to you will tell that the child tries to close one eye when they step out or when they see a bright light that is typical of photalgia okay the eye which diverges there is too much of flashing of the light so to avoid that they automatically close one eye okay okay, that okay. In adults, in young children, they develop hemiretinal suppression and can develop amblyopia. Adults cannot develop suppression, usually do not develop suppression and amblyopia. They have diplopia. 
and they also have yeah, that is intermittent divergent squint which develops in a child who is visually mature those children usually present with symptoms of intermittent diplopia during their intermittent exotropic phase okay because they will not be able to suppress because your sensory sensing has already developed patient of intermittent exotropia goes through a few phases the phases 1 2 3 and 4 in phase 1 the patient has an exophoria at distance and is orthophoric at near and is asymptomatic in phase 2 the patient develops intermittent exotropia at distance and is still orthophoric or may develop exophoria at near and is only symptomatic for distance in phase 3 the patient has a constant exotropia at distance with a exophoria or intermittent exotropia at near and the patient is binocular his binocularity is maintained for near and develops a suppression scotoma for distance in patients with phase 4 they have an exotropia both for distance and near and do not have binocular single vision at all now what is the importance of knowing the phases the importance is for us to actually uh once the constant exotropia is developed it is not amenable to ther- the therapy because the patient might have already developed suppression yeah, yeah, coma and angle it can be based on the phase of exotivation that's the idea of knowing the phase okay at what phase you need to intervene before the binocularity comes down you need to intervene so you need to be watchful of all these phases so that you intervene accordingly surgically okay you go on so the natural history of the disease is the progression from exophoria to intermittent exotropia to exotropia and also the deviation the angle of deviation also increases so the frequency of manifestation increases and so does the angle spontaneous resolution of intermittent exotropia is rare and there occurs an increase in deviation usually over the years and one noted in a study which he conducted found that there is a progression in 75% of untreated cases of intermittent exotropia and improvement was seen in only 16% of the cases most importantly the factors which affect progression of disease include the decrease in tonic convergence with age the decrease in accommodative power with age development of suppression and increasing divergence of the orbits with age So there are a few factors which need to be kept in mind when we look for progression. Progression can be seen as loss of fusional control, as evidenced by increasing the frequency and manifest phase of the nystagmus, development of secondary convergence if insufficiency, increase in the size of basic deviation, and development of suppression. There are a few important points to note in history because these actually guide our management principles later on, which is the age of onset, frequency and duration of deviation. and progression in the frequency and duration as evidenced by the factors that we will consider and the history points that we will ask the patient coming to the evaluation of a patient with intermittent exotropia which can be broadly divided into sensory and motor in sensory evaluation it is imperative that we ask ourselves six questions the questions being is there binocularity present is there any diplopia if there is any diplopia what type of diplopia is present what type of correspondence is present is it normal harmonious anomalous or anomalous is there suppression which is present and if so what is the extent and depth of suppression is there amblyopia and what is the grade of stereopsis so binocularity and diplopia you can evaluate these by using red green goggles pagolini striated glasses single or double madocus rod test which are actually dissociating tests they help dissociate the visual stimuli of both the eyes and help in visualization of the diplopia so the patient is made aware of the diplopia to check correspondence correspondence can be normal or anomalous we can check correspondence by using the work for dot test or bagolini's glasses or an after image test in suppression only one eye functions suppression can be either unilateral or alternating facultative suppression means that the suppression is present only in binocular conditions and obligatory suppression means that the suppression is present during monocular conditions as well it is important for us to note the extent and the depth of suppression as well so there are a few important sensory adaptations to exotaviation which are as follows that in phoric phase of intermittent exotropia when the patient is in exophoria phase that is phase 1 the eyes are perfectly aligned and the patient will have bifocal fusion and his stereo acuity is going to be excellent ranging between 40 to 60 seconds of eye so in phase 1 which is the phoric phase the eyes are aligned and the stereo acuity which is the most sensitive indicator of binocular uh, vision and the highest form of acuity is excellent during the tropia phase 
when the exotropia is manifest, the patients will show large areas of regional suppression in temporal retina. That is, the patient is going to develop bitemporal hemiretinal suppression. In tropic phase, the patient can have anomalous retinal correspondence. And the, in the phoric phase, the patient can have normal retinal correspondence. In few patients of intermittent exotropia, they may develop a monofixation syndrome and they do not develop normal bifobial fixation and do not develop high grade of stereopsis, although this is rare. Some rare patients of intermittent exotropia may also develop significant amblyopia. A patient with late onset exotropia after six to seven years of age may experience diplopia. That is, the patient is more visually mature now because the exotropia occurs after the loss of plasticity that allows for suppression. This is an important point for us to note that this age, six to seven years, this is actually going to guide us in our management wherein we have a different set of management principle, principles for the children who are less than four to six years of age and we have a different set of management principles for children who are above this age. Coming to motor evaluation, in motor evaluation we have to assess the control, we have to measure the deviation, we have to measure the AC by A ratio, conversions. An important point which is of significance in intermittent exotropia which we might miss is the lateral incompetence. Usually we, as a part of routine examination of a case of squint also, we measure the deviation in all nine gazes and even though the case might look straightforward, we have to make it a point to measure the deviation in all nine gazes because this lateral incompetence has repercussions in the management principles that we'll discuss later on. And last point we have to note in motor evaluation is the prism adaptation test. Coming to assessment of control, we have subjective and objective methods. In subjective methods, we have to observe the patient at home or the office. Home control, we have to grade the home control on the basis of how frequently the eye deviates. Excellent control means that the eye deviates only under stressful conditions and only for distance. Good control means that the deviation is only for distance and occurs less than five times a day. Fair control in which deviation occurs more than five times a day and only for distance. And poor control denotes that there are frequent deviations at both distance as well as near. For office control, which we can assess ourselves in the good control means that the few that the alignment breaks only after cover testing and the alignment resumes fusion rapidly without blink or refixation. In this first example, we can see good office control in which after we put the occluder, the eye has deviated outwards. On the removal of the occluder without blink or refixation, the patient has had spontaneous realignment. Fair control means that the patient has to blink to control the deviation after disruption with cover testing. In this example of fair control, on putting the occluder, the eye has deviated outwards. On the removal of the occluder, the eye is still in exodeviation and the patient actually has to blink or refixate with the eye to maintain proper alignment. Poor control means that the fusion breaks spontaneously without any form of fusion disruption, without the use of any occluder or any dissociating test and it does not spontaneously regain alignment despite blink or refixation. As you can see in this patient, the patient has an exodeviation even without putting an occluder which denotes that the patient has a poor control. Objective methods of control include the measurement of distance and near stereo equity and alternate letter suppression testing. There is an important scoring system which we all use on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinic which is the Newcastle scoring system which is again divided into home control and clinic control. In home control, the patient is going to have exotropia or monocular eye closure like ma'am explained, the photalgia or dyslopia phobia. The patient is either going to have exotropia or monocular eye closure because the patient has photalgia or the patient does not want to face the troublesome diplopia. In home control, if the patient never has these symptoms, the score is zero. If it is less than 50% of the time and when the patient is fixing in distance, the score is one. More than 50% of the time fixing in distance, the score is two. And more than 50% of the time while the patient is fixing in distance, as well as seen when the patient is fixing at near, the score is three. The clinic control has to be demonstrated separately for both near and distance. The scores given for them are similar. Immediate realignment after dissociation by using an occluder, the score is zero. Realignment with the aid 
of link or refixation, the score is 1. The, rear, the exot deviation remains manifest after dissociation or prolonged fixation, the score is 2. And the exot deviation which manifests spontaneously, the score is 3. Same scores apply for distance as well. And the total Newcastle score is out of 9 and we have to add these 3. Glyopia occurs in very few patients in the patients of intermittent exotropia, much less common than patients of esotropia. Amblyopia, if it occurs in patients of intermittent exotropia, it is usually associated with anisometropia as well, which adds an anisometric uh, metropic amblyopia component to the amblyopia. To measure the deviation, we have to measure the distance deviation with accommodative target at 6, me six meters in a well-illuminated room with the patient bearing full correction. You have to use prisms and perform the alternate cover test. Sometimes to get the real full exotropia angle, we might have to do a far distance test in which the patient can be made to fixate at a far distance more than six meters. Prolonged occlusion may be required to eliminate fusion conversion for which we have to catch the eye for 30 minutes, which eliminates the fusion conversion. Another important aspect of the evaluation in a patient of intermittent exotropia, which has implications on management, is the AC by A ratio. We have to measure the convergence. AC by A ratio is nothing but the conversion, convergence which is produced by accommodation per diopter of accommodation. It can be measured either by gradient method or heteroporic method. The AC by A ratio is usually contaminated by proximal fusion and has contribution by proximal fusion which can mislead us and this sustained version masks the true magnitude of near deviation and hence this requires a more than a brief cover to break the uh, tenacious proximal fusion hence we have to patch the eye for at least 30 to 45 minutes after patching the eye we have to perform the test with either a plus 3 diopter lens at near or a minus 2 diopter lens at distance coming to lateral incomitance it was first described by Moore in lateral incomitance there is a difference in deviation in primary position and lateral gaze. There is a significant difference in the deviation ranging from 5 to 10 prism diopters. Lateral incomitance also helps in deciding on the amount of surgery on the horizontal rectus muscles. An important point for measuring conversions. Now, what is the reason for the lateral incomitance? You are uh, talking about incomitance. Now, what causes this? Uh, I'm the innervation of the anatomic factors. You check for the extraocular moments, there might be limitation of the extraocular moments because of long-standing tight lateral rectus muscle, you might end up with an incompetence. So if you're going to do a, a surgery on the lateral, uh, this thing, lateral rectus recession or something, then you need to change your table accordingly because a tight uh, lateral rectus, if you're going to release, the standard tables may not be applicable. So that is the idea of knowing the lateral incompetence and then planning accordingly. If there is an incompetence of more than 10 minutes, then you cannot apply the standard table what you do for a bilateral lateral rectus recession. You might have to undercorrect it a little bit because your outcome is going to be more. You will be getting more of a correction for a lesser amount of recession. So that is the basic reason why you have to be particular about the incompetence, your pattern and everything because your outcome of your surgical plan will vary accordingly. Okay. okay. Because you might end up with an overcorrection if you do the same standard table correction. Okay. Okay. So convergence is the binocular versions that increases the angle formed by visual axis through simultaneous adduction of both the eyes. By A ratio. What is the significance of this AC by A ratio? You're going on telling about the classification and everything. You're planning surgery, you plan accordingly based on your AC by A ratio. Why? Why is it so important? I'm in patients of... Ah, ah yeah. Tell me. I'm in patients with a higher AC by A ratio. We might tend to, uh, you mean, overestimate the amount of deviation and hence we might tend to overcorrect these patients. So we can actually give them correction for that and uh, then correct only uh, for whatever the deviation is and we can correct the accommodative component using lenses. So what happens if you miss making a note of the AC by A ratio and you end and up... We will get a consecutive isotropia, ma'am. For? Is it for distance or for near? For near, ma'am. Yeah, and what do you end up in a small cell if you're going to have an isotropia for near? I mean, we, we are going to have uh, amblyopia and suppression. Uh, monofixators. They'll yes. develop. Okay, so ideally, a, a child who's going to be having an IDS will have a good stereopsis if you have not intervened. But rather, you go and intervene and then you end up with an ET for a near. And in a reading child, I mean, in a child who's more into reading, then you're actually disrupting the stereopsis or binocular fusion. So that is very, very important that you pick up the high AC by A ratio. So for measuring the conversions, 
uh, we have to add base of prisms. Uh, once the patient starts yeah. seeing yeah. double. Moment of convergence you do as a, I mean, uh, motor evaluation or squint, you do all these things. Yes. Okay. Okay. You go on to the next one. So once the patient appreciates the diplopia, which is the break point, after that, we gradually reduce the base out prisms and the patient again regains single vision, which is known as the recovery point. Uh, an amplitude of convergence, which is less than 20 diopters per distance and less than 35 diopters per near or a near point of convergence, which is beyond 10 centimeter, is classified as a convergence insufficiency. So on the basis of measurement of deviation, like we discussed at length in the classification, if the exotropia for distance and near are within 10 prism diopters of each other. We have the basic type. If the exotropia or distance is more than near by more than 10 prism diopters, we have divergence success, in which case we have to perform the patch test for at least 30 to 45 minutes to disrupt the tenacious proximal fusion. After that, if the distance and near deviations are within 10 prism diopters of each other, it is known as simulated divergence access or a pseudo divergence access type. If still the distance is more than near, which is known as a true divergent excess type. And as shown by the Kushner study, 60% of these patients are still going to have a high AC by A ratio and 40% of the patients are going to have a normal AC by A ratio. We'll test this using a plus three diopter. And the third category is an exotropia, which was more for near than distance, which is known as convergence insufficiency. So after having worked up the case and after having classified the case, we go on to the management. Management options are non-surgical and surgical options. Non-surgical options, they are indicated when the patient has excellent control and has normal distance theriopsis. And in young children, with the risk of developing esotropia due to overcorrection. So what are the options we have in non-surgical management? They include the refractive error correction, use of minus lenses, use of prisms, and use of orthoptics. So as we talked about, the natural history of this disease was first, they had decreased fusional amplitudes, then the patient developed diplopia, and then the patient had suppression and amblyopia. Similarly, the management is going to go in reverse order. First, we are going to treat the suppression and amblyopia. For amblyopia, we are going to give occlusion, part-time occlusion, correct the refractive error, and the anti-suppression exercises are going to actually help the patient get aware of the diplopia. Then we are going to have a diplopia training wherein we are going to help the patient have single vision and appreciate the diplopia in the free space. And thirdly, we want to improve the amplitude as well as stamina of the fusional conversions. The non-surgical management, which is usually done when the deviation is less than 20 prism diopters, we correct refractive error because a refractive error impairs the fusion and promotes a manifest deviation. So correcting the refractive error will convert a tropia to foria as we are providing a clear retinal image and hence it enables a better control of the exodeviation. In hypermetropes, plus lenses can increase the angle of deviation and hence our goal in hypermetropes is to correct with least possible plus lenses. Contrast to this, we can use overcorrecting minus lenses therapy in myopes. In myopes, we can use slight two to three diopters minus over correction over the cycloplegic refraction because this minus correction is actually going to stimulate the accommodative conversions which can reduce an exodeviation. This is especially helpful in patients who have a high AC by A ratio. So this is helpful in patients who are younger children and have a small angle isotropia that is only of 5 to 15 prism diopters or in patients where it is preferable to defer the surgery for any reason. So you have to be really choosy in opting for this treatment plan. Okay, child has to be a preferably a myo. You can overcorrect it a little bit. And if you're not, if you're contemplating on surgery, if you want to postpone the surgery for any other systemic reasons also, whether the child is not fit for anesthesia or something where you want to postpone the surgery or you don't want to end up with an overcorrection, those children are the ones who will be suitable for uh, over minus correction. And over minus correction, there is a flip side to it because you need to wean off the over minus over a period of time. And the effort for the child to relax that effort of uh, this thing, uh, accommodation also takes a longer time. 
So even immediately after taking off the minus lenses, you cannot plan the surgery for the angle what the child has because that will be a relatively lesser. And it starts building up over a period of time. It can even be up to a year's time that the child will have the absolute manifestation of the deviation. So never plan surgery immediately after you take off the glasses and then you and then you operate for that particular angle because the angle will actually be more because the child is so adapted to the over minus lenses. So if you're prescribing over minus glasses, you have to follow it up very closely. And even these children, if you're going to give over minus glasses, they might be auto for distance. But if you look carefully for near, they might have a small ET. You might be inducing an ET with the over minus glasses. So that also needs to be taken into account. So first checkup should be at three month interval to see if the child is having ortho for near as well. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Another management option in the non-surgical management is the prisms. We use base and prisms to enforce bifobular stimulation and it can be used to improve the fusional control or as a temporary measure either pre-operatively or post-operatively to make sure that the patient can achieve binocular single vision. Up to 15 prism diopters of resonant prisms over each eye is acceptable. We cannot prescribe more than 15 prism diopters of resonant prisms over each eye. So for large angle exophoria, exotropias, this option is not very well. Part-time occlusion is used in very young children and it is a part of passive anti-suppression techniques as opposed to the active techniques which in involve the patient being aware of their diplopia. Uh, Part-time occlusion of the non-deviating eye for at least four to six hours can help convert an intermittent exotropia to an exophoria. An alternate occlusion may be used in patients who have alternate fixation and after starting part-time occlusion, we have to re-evaluate re after four months. If the angle has reduced, then we continue with the part-time occlusion and again re-evaluate after four months. If on any re-evaluations, the angle shows no improvement, then we discontinue the part-time occlusion. So this part-time occlusion can be used to postpone surgical intervention in patients who are responsive orthoptic treatment. So the aim of orthoptic treatment is to make the patient aware of the manifest deviation and to improve the control of that deviation. So we have two options which are anti-suppression exercises and relative convergence exercises. In anti-suppression exercises, the treatment is directed to diplopia recognition. There is a suppression scotoma for distance initially and that uh, suppression scotoma at distance is amenable to therapy by flashes and then the binocular single vision is then maintained by anti-suppression exercises like bar reading or synaptophores or chiroscope. The other option being relative convergence exercises. With the anti-suppression exercises, we are making the patient aware of the diplopia and with relative convergence exercises, we are aiming to improve the control over the manifest deviation and to actually have a single binocular vision rather than the diplopia. So with the relative convergence exercises, atropia is converted to phoria, but the angle of deviation remains the same, only that the control over the deviation improves. The appreciation of a physiological diplopia should be taught as the first step in the relative convergence exercises, and it helps improve the amplitude and stamina of conversions. The examples of relative convergence exercises include pencil push-up exercises, Brock string exercises, cat card exercises, prism convergence exercises and red filter convergence exercises. So like I said before, in anti-suppression exercises, the aim is to make the patient aware that he has diplopia. The second step is to make the patient, teach the patient how to hold fixation with either eye, always seeing the blurred image from the deviated eye. So we are seeing the clear image from one eye, but in the free space, we'll also be seeing a blurred image. If the deviation is sufficiently large, we should first aim for surgical alignment and also start these exercises post-operatively. So all these exercises can be done pre-operatively as well as post-operatively. The third step is to make the patient learn the fusion on both an instrument and in free space. And the fourth step is to improve the fusional amplitude once fusion is achieved. So in this example, patient is holding a card and it has two cats on it. And as you can see, one cat only has a tail and the other cat has ears. So they are two dissimilar images. The patient is also holding a pen near to the eyes. At arm's length, this card is held. What we have to tell the patient to do is, while fixating at the pen, the patient has to try and merge these two cats into a single cat centrally to form a whole cat. 
This is also known as stereogram or also known as a cat card. The second example is that of pencil push-up in which the patient is simply holding a pencil in front of the eye at arm's length and focusing on the tip of the pencil, making sure that she sees only one pencil. And slowly the patient is bringing forward the pencil towards her nose, all the while maintaining that the patient sees only one single pencil. At the point the patient reaches where she sees double, she has to get, go a bit backwards and try and maintain that single image for a while of like 30-45 seconds and then again go back and repeat the exercise at least 10 times. The main important point to be noted about the orthoptics exercises is that they are just like any other exercise. The longer you, so long as you keep doing these exercises, the control will remain maintained. And if you stop the exercises, the control again will start to diminish. The third option that we have all seen is the Brock string in which you have two strings and we have beads of different colors over it. Initially, you have to look at the red ball which is closest to the eye until you see a V pattern or a Y pattern. Next, we focus at the yellow ball until we see an X pattern. And last, we focus on the green ball in which we see an A pattern. All these exercises can be given to the patient to be performed at home as well as in office. You teach them these exercises and send them home to repeat these exercises at home. Coming to surgical management of intermittent exotropia, the timing of surgery, like I mentioned before, the age in matters. Usually that surgery for intermittent exotropia is done in children more than four years of age. The reason being that we have an accurate diagnosis and the quantification of the amount of deviation is possible well in children who are more than four years of age and this actually helps us avoid consecutive mesotropia and the subsequent development of amblyopia. Surgery in the age group less than four years of age is reserved only in patients in whom there is rapid loss of control. In the interim, we can give them minus lenses or part-time patching and other non-surgical methods and these patients can be followed closely for signs of progression. So the inter uh, important signs of progression of intermittent exotropia include the loss of fusional control, which is the increasing frequency of manifestation and development of secondary convergence insufficiency, increase in the size of basic deviation, development of suppression as indicated by absence of diplopia during the manifest phase and the decrease of stereoacuity. So the choice of surgery depends on a few factors. As we discussed in the evaluation, we have to evaluate evaluate uh, deviation at distance, far distance and near, the AC by A ratio and whether the patient is a true divergence axis or a simulated divergence axis, the presence of A pattern or V pattern with or without any inferior oblique or superior oblique overaction and if there is a change in deviation on lateral versions, that is if there is lateral incompetence. So classically we've been taught that the divergence axis has to be treated with a bilateral a lateral rectus muscle recession. Simulated divergence axis type and basic type are treated with a unilateral lateral res, uh, rectus re, uh, muscle recession and medial, rec, uh, medial rectus muscle resection and the convergence insufficiency type is treated with a bilateral medial rectus muscle resection. However, modern teaching states that bilateral la uh, lateral rectus muscle resections is to be done for all types except for convergence insufficiency. So earlier, where we did a unilateral recess resect for simulated divergence axis and basic type, that is no longer followed. In simulated divergence axis and basic type as well, we do a bilateral lateral rectus muscle recession. If lateral incompetence is present and especially if the deviation in the lateral gaze is 50% lesser than what it was in primary, it is more likely that we will overcorrect with the surgery. As ma'am like, uh, rightly said, if we use the tables which we use normally, we will tend to overcorrect for the surgery and hence in patients with lateral incompetence, we have to aim for a slight undercorrection in the surgery. A or V pattern is present, then oblique surgery and vertical shift procedures are performed along with it. And generally, if A or V pattern uh, are present, then we prefer to do lateral rectus muscle recession because from the same approach, we can also tackle the oblique muscles. So this is a table which denotes the amount of MMs we have to recess or resect according to the deviation in prism diopters. I'll not go in detail about this. I think it can be handy to have in your phone or rather chart in your office for quick reference because it is quite tough to get it memorized.
So the goal of surgery in our patients for children immediately after surgery, we aim for a small consecutive esotropia of up to 8 to 10 prism diopters. Uh, the post-operative diplopia, if it occurs, is used to stimulate the development of fusional vergences and to stabilize the post-operative alignment. So we actually want to have a small consecutive esotropia and that small consecutive esotropia can give us a diplopia which is going to stimulate the fusional vergences. So one must always keep in mind the age of the patient when planning surgery since consecutive esotropia in a very small child which is a visually immature infant can have consequences of amblyopia and loss of binocularity. In adults and children who are more than 10 years of age who usually present with diplopia as their plasticity of the nervous system is lost, in these patients we have to aim for orthotropia in the immediate post-operative period. Coming to a few complications of the surgery, few anesthesia related complications, intraoperative complications like operating the wrong eye, operating the wrong muscle or injury to other muscles, perforation of the globe, hemorrhage and lost muscle. Post operative complications include infection, the formation of granulomas, anterior segment ischemia, especially when we operate on three muscles in the same eye, post operative scarring and subsequent restriction of extraocular motility, post operative diplopia and gaze incompetence. Two important complications to be considered are undercorrection, which is a residual exotropia, and overcorrection, which is a consecutive esotropia. The management of these are not under the purview of this. These are my references. Oh, thank you, Pranav. I think that was quite an elaborate class. I don't think you have left behind anything. I think you have dealt everything in detail. But the only thing for the fellows, I think whoever is listening, I think I want all of you to read up the uh, study on uh, surgical outcome by Kushna. Because he gives you the, uh, I mean, uh, surgical pearls with regard to outcome of uh, surgeries and patients who have undergone intermittent XP. So, basically, um, you mean uh, your surgical outcome varies depending upon the type of your intermittent uh, divergence quint as well. So, the ones who really do well are those who have the tenacious proximal fusion. That is the pseudo divergence existent. So those patients, if you pick up those patients and if you operate on them, those uh, surgical outcomes are going to be really good. Okay, but the ones who have those uh, high AC by A ratio, they are the ones who finally end up with an ET. Okay, so always be choosy in your surgical plan and always expect all these things so that you manage them accordingly. So, and one more thing, if there is a patient who has a you do a patch test and then you are measuring somewhere around 45 and then you do a patch test and then your uh, distance deviation itself increases to 50 or 55. Then your surgical plan should be for the maximum amount of deviation. So that will be your target uh, angle for which you plan the surgery. So these things alone, I just wanted to add that apart. I think he has dealt everything in detail. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you for your guidance, ma'am. Thank you very much. Ma yeah.